Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, and we resume our study today in verse 11. So get your Bible, if you can, open it up to Matthew 5. We'll begin in just a minute. Do want to remind you, as I do on every broadcast, that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at the Bible verse by verse dot com. There you can study all of God's word with me, any part of God's word, any book, any section, any chapter. Um, simply choose, click, and listen, or you can begin in the beginning, Genesis, and go all the way through the book of Revelation, however you want to do it. It's important to study God's word just the way he gave it, one verse at a time. And you can do that with me at the thebibleversebyverse.com. There are four series going on, five, all archived going back over 36 years at the thebibleversebyverse.com. And Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth, your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Matthew 5, verse 11, <clears throat> where Jesus says, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Now, it is interesting that I read this verse today because just last night I received an email from somebody who is experiencing this, an on-fire Christian that was followed by a phone call from somebody else who was experiencing the exact same thing. And unfortunately, they were receiving this opposition from professing evangelical Christians, which is what I've been trying to tell you folks for years. Modern evangelicalism is apostate. They are in the category of lukewarm. Now, I know there's always an exception here and there of a person, but as a whole, modern evangelicalism is apostate. They are worldly. They're concerned about the world. They're concerned about being like the world, accepted by the world. And they attack in some ways, ridicule, mock, Christians who actually love Jesus and love the word and take the word of God seriously. And it's not going to get any better. But there are people that I hear from throughout this country and even some other countries who listen to scripture verse by verse, watch scripture verse by verse, and they all experience the same thing from modern evangelicalism. But like I told somebody last night, it's a part of the deal. And actually, it always has been for those who are on fire. If you're going to go all out for Jesus, then brace yourself. Because people are going to talk behind your back. They're going to say things about you that are not true. You're going to suffer in some way from them. Maybe ridicule, maybe mocking, maybe who knows what. And the really terrible thing is that this will come a large part, at least today, from professing Christians who wouldn't know Jesus Jesus if they appear if he appeared before them and stood nose to nose, they wouldn't recognize him because he's not the the real Jesus is not the cool Jesus, the hipster Jesus that they learn about in their churches. Piece of garbage. That's what their churches are. Garbage. Misrepresenting Jesus. Lukewarm trash. Passing for sermons. And many of you have experienced that. You've seen the difference. <clears throat> Verse 12. But Jesus says, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they, the prophets, who were before you. So, 
it's a good, good idea to study the Old Testament because there are a lot of stories about God's prophets and how they were persecuted. The few, the remnant of faithful prophets who were going against the grain, not just of the lost world, but of professing religionist as well. And they had to go against them because they spoke the pure word of God and they went back down and they were persecuted because of it. And here Jesus says, if that happens to you, you're living for me, you're doing the right thing, you're speaking the truth of God's word and you, and you get persecuted in some way for that, rejoice because you're in the category of the faithful prophets of the Old Testament. And that's a real good reason to rejoice. Verse 13, ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savor, with what shall it be salted? It is therefore good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. So basically he just said that these lukewarm professing Christians and these others who oppose you, they're worthless. And it will be seen on Judgment Day just how worthless they are because they're going to be trampled underfoot. And that will be done by the angels. But Jesus mentioned salt. You're the salt of the earth. Who's he talking to? He's talking to people who love him and love the word of God. Salt is a preservative. In other words, it hinders corruption. And salt also brings out the flavor of food. Salt also creates a thirst for living for Jesus when you're talking about spiritual thought because salt creates, creates a thirst, right? It preserves, it creates a thirst. So if you're the salt of the earth living by Jesus or living for Jesus and living the word of God, even in the face of opposition, you're going to give some people who are hungry for truth a thirst for Jesus, a real thirst for the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're living for Christ, we're going to be a blessing to this world and we're also going to create a thirst for Jesus and those who have a heart for God. We are like salt if we are saved and walking in the Spirit. 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot be hidden. Our job as a Christian is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to live for Jesus so that the light of Christ's goodness shines through us. If we do that, the world's going to notice. 15. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel, but on a lampstand, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. A lamp on the floor will not do you much good if you're sitting on the couch trying to read, right? The higher your lamp is, the better it is for everyone in the room. The light diffuses all across the room, not just on the floor, especially if you have a shade. That's what I'm thinking. Um, <clears throat> verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Christian character is what Jesus is talking about right here. So easy to live for Jesus when you're with other Christians who love him. So easy to do that. But God also wants us to live for Jesus at work and in school and with our families, even those hard to get along with people. He wants us to live for Jesus no matter where we are no matter who we are with, he wants us to remain steadfast, on fire for Jesus Christ. Verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. In other words, Jesus came to proclaim the word of God and the law of God and to live it perfectly. Verse 18, 
For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no way pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So a jot and a tittle in the uh, original languages referred to like a serif on a letter or a comma, a punctuation mark, something like that. The dotting of an I, perhaps. And Jesus says, not one jot or tittle are going to pass from the law. And you can include the whole word of God in that statement. That's how secure the written word of God is. God, God, God inspired it. He gave it through revelation. He then inspired the writers to write it down accurately. And he has preserved it for 2,000 years. And thankfully, it has been preserved through the received text upon which the King James Version and the slight updates of the King James Version are based on, and no other modern translation, because Satan got his claws into the trans translation world about 130 years, 150 years ago. And he's corrupted the word of God in that manner. But God has preserved his true word because none of it's going to pass away. And Jesus taught that each word of the Bible is a word of God and nothing in scripture, even the smallest part of a single solitary letter is without importance. That's, how, that's what Jesus' view of Holy Scripture is. And I don't know about you, but whatever Jesus believes about the Bible or anything else for that matter, that's what I want to believe. That's what I'm interested in believing. 19. Whosoever, therefore, shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The word of God is contrary to the sinful nature of man. And that's why people try to explain the word of God away. They try to explain the word of God away because they don't like to hear it because it's contrary to their sin nature. Oftentimes pastors, especially in modern evangelicalism, leave out the parts of God's word that may not set well with people in their sin nature that they cater to. They leave it out. Being unfaithful to God in the process. The word of God is contrary to the sinful nature of man. That's why people try to explain it away. That's why preachers and Bible teachers so-called today so often leave out parts of the word of God. And there are many reasons why people water down the word of God. And all those reasons, I can tell you this, involve this, loving self more than loving God. And it's shameful. It's disgraceful. God says that if you are a Christian, and you water down my word. Well, let's just say it's not going to be good. He didn't go into great detail, but it's not going to be good for that person. 20. For I say unto you, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. The scribes and the Pharisees were content with the religious ceremonies and the religious rituals. They were perfectly content with that. That's why they never repented. That's why they rejected Christ as Savior. A Savior? What do we need a Savior for? We're religious. The scribes and the Pharisees had a lot of religion. Lots of religion. But their religion and anybody else's religion by itself does not impart the righteousness that is needed to get to heaven. To get to heaven, you need the righteousness that God credits to your account when you repent of your sin and you ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. You make a commitment to live for him. It's not that you do it perfectly. It's not that you're saved by works. But, when you, but if you are truly receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior, 
then you are also receiving Jesus Christ as the Lord because that's who he is. And if he's the Lord that you're receiving, you are repenting of your sin and you're turning to him. And whether you realize it or not, you're making a commitment to make him your Lord, to live as if he's your Lord. So don't tell me that that's salvation by works. It's not. It's receiving Christ and meaning business. We'll stop. Study all of God's word with me at thebibleversebyverse.com. Choose, click, and listen from four complete series going through the whole Bible, verse by verse. If you'd like to be a part of Scripture verse by verse, pray for me and God's word. That makes you an immediate part of this ministry. I appreciate it very much. Also, when you take a break from studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com, you can go to the front page, click the donate button, and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. That also makes you a part of this ministry. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse. Thank you for studying with me. So long, everyone.